Good evening and welcome everyone. Jalasi, bienvenue tout le monde, falche. And welcome to all our guests joining us uh, this evening online for the Brian Mulroney Institute of Government Distinguished Speaker Sp Series. My name is Richard Eisner. I'm the Associate Vice President of Research, Graduate and Professional Studies here at St. of X and Interim Director of the Brian Mulroney Institute of Government. I'd like to begin this evening's program with a territorial land acknowledgement. St. Francis Xavier University stands on the lands of Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded home of the Mi'kmaq. We express our deep gratitude and appreciation to the generations of Mi'kmaq who, since time immemorial, have loved and stewarded these lands and the beings that call them home. Colonization is not just history, it exists in the present tense. While we strive to decolonize ourselves and our university, we know there is still much for us to learn. We are committed to doing the hard work of self-reflection and to repairing relationships with the Mi'kmaq on whose lands we reside and, embrace, and embracing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and embodying their spirit in our day-to-day -day lives. We are all treaty people. This evening, the Brian Mulroney Institute of Government is honored to welcome Ryan Manucha as part of its Distinguished Speaker Series. Ryan is a leading scholar on interprovincial trade in Canada. He obtained his Juris Doctor from Harvard Law School, where he was awarded the Frederick Sheldon Fellowship to pursue research on interprovincial trade. He obtained a BA in Economics, magna cum laude, from Yale University. Ryan presently serves as an external advisor to the federal government. His work has appeared in several of Canada's leading legal journals, including the Osgoode Hall Law Review, the Canadian Business Law Journal, the Canadian Journal of Administrative Law and Practice, as well as in significant periodicals, such as the Globe and Mail, the Ottawa Sun, and Maclean's Magazine. He has appeared on TVO's The Agenda with Steve Pakin and CBC Radio, among other outlets. He has also authored reports published by Canada's leading think tanks, such as the C.D. Howe Institute and the Macdonald Laurier Institute. In 2022, he was commissioned to conduct a policy review for the government of Alberta. And most recently, his interdisciplinary book on the topic was published by McGill Queens University Press as part of its Brian Mulroney Institute on Government Studies in Leadership public policy and governance. This book, Booze, Cigarettes and Constitutional Dust-Ups, won the 2022 Donner Prize for the best book on Canadian public policy writing. Following Ryan's lecture tonight, a Q&A session will be uh, moderated by Dr. Doug Brown, Distinguished Fellow with the Brian Mulroney Institute of Government. I'd like to thank Dr. Anna Zuschlag for uh, organizing tonight's uh, event. Uh, Anna is the manager of uh, program and research manager with the Brian Mulroney Institute of Government and uh, was responsible for putting this event together. So everyone, please join me in welcoming Ryan Manucha, who this evening will present his lecture on booze, cigarettes and constitutional dust-ups, Canada's quest for interprovincial trade. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. That's very kind. Thank you very much. Just want to start with some thank yous to Dr. Zuschlag uh, for hosting and coordinating the evening, to Dr. or Professor Brown and uh, Eisner for hosting a, uh, a wonderful evening, and to the Brian Mulroney Institute at large and the university in general for this wonderful event. And uh, thank you to my wife who has accompanied me in the back there. <laughs> Um, they, we'll start with the uh, sort of a motivational question here. Um, Canadians march behind the same flag during the Olympics and don the same uniform in times of war. And as such, should our conception of citizenship along with our timeless pursuit of maximal economic growth mean that Canada should have free, unfettered free trade uh, amongst the provinces and territories? Now, I won't ask you to raise your hands, but I'd be curious if you are confident, would you be willing to raise your hands and uh, whether you agree and say yes to this question? Okay, very cool, thank you. A uh, bit about me, but you heard about that. 
Um, some motivational images to start as well. Uh, I think this one's kind of iconic here. We've got Trudeau, who's just negotiated the USMCA with Canada, US, and Mexico, and then the retrospective about the borders internally. But uh, moving to maybe a bit more uh, serious uh, version of this, let's think about what does, what does internal trade even have to do with cost of living crisis? Like, is there a nexus between sort of this rampant cost of, of everything around us, whether it be food or building? Um, and then what about Canada's productivity? It's, it's massive slippage from the 1980s to now, and then the projections kind of some stunning numbers there. And if you look at it, Canada relative to the OECD averages, um, kind of telling. Um, is there a nexus between internal trade and the way that cost of our inputs, our goods and services are augmented, affecting every part of our economy, whether it be our groceries, our lumber, and our whole of economy productivity? There has been some fantastic research and folks are welcome to dispute the numbers that got put out. I realize these, this text is quite small. Um, professor, especially the work of Professor Toom out of the University of Calgary, really measuring, trying to put some numbers to the impact of internal trade barriers, trade irritants. And in you know, studies anywhere between 7.8 and 15% of prices to goods and services are augmented because of these internal trade irritants. Um, if we were to lift internal trade barriers, we could see you know, another from the IMF. Uh, increase in GDP per capita by about 4% in this day and age where we're looking for maximal economic growth post-pandemic. And this is one of those areas we don't have to rely on foreign fickle trading partners and you know folks from abroad and legislatures that we have zero control over. We're talking about folks as we started this conversation, folks who wear the same uniform at times of war. I'd like to move to the story of Gerard Kumo. It's quite famous, so I apologize for those who uh, already heard of it, and I don't blame you if you have not. Uh, Gerard Kumo was a retiree who lived in Trakadi Sheila, uh, coastal New Brunswick, and four times a year, uh, Kumo would travel to Campbellton, a border town, to pick up a bunch of beer. It was cheaper, and he's a rational economic actor, so why blame him? It was on a fateful fall afternoon in October 2012, when this time around, he gets trailed and detained by the RCMP. Um, what was the law he broke? He had brought over uh, in excess of the legal limit back into New Brunswick from another province. I'm not talking about another country, another province. What was the limit? Uh, 12 beers. He brought more than, okay, truth be told, he had about 300 beers in his trunk. So he didn't really, it wasn't like close. <laughs> um, 12 beers. And so we might ask ourselves, you know, how was, can we even connect uh, the cap on the number of beers in your trunk uh, to a trade barrier? And even if it is a trade barrier, are we okay with that as a, as a, as a country? We're a federal state. I know uh, Professor Brown here has, uh, uh, will, will, could tell us a lot more than I can about federalism in Canada. Uh, but you know, maybe this is an acceptable trade-off. Uh, Al Cool, New Brunswick might say, oh, we're better at guarding against uh, uh, underage consumption or overconsumption. Therefore, we should be the ones who sell it. I mean, some of us may be a bit more cynical and read between the lines of what was argued in that court case and say it was all about revenue, which it was. Um, but, you know, being in a, in a federal society, do we accept these differences? We accept what makes us unique. What, was, what were the legs that Mr. Kumo had to stand on, or he was attempting to stand on before the Supreme Court and uh, the decision ultimately released in 2018? And it revolved around the Section 121. Um, and I'll give you a moment to read it, but if you don't want to, or if just the, distil the distillation of the essence is if you read that on its face, it looks an awful lot like a declaration that there's free trade in Canada. It's in the Constitution Act, formerly the British North America Act. It's pretty clear on its face. And yet Mr. Kumo's uh, fine and penalties was upheld at the Supreme, by the Supreme Court through to 2018. Um, so how do you square him not being allowed to bring back more than 12 beers with this constitutional provision at 121. A lot of lawyers and historians and political scientists will go back to what they were saying at the time of to kind of shed some light. So if we see this disconnect between Kumo and 121, we might say, oh, well, let's go look back. What were the drafters at the time thinking about when they wrote 121? Maybe that can clarify why we have this massive disconnect between the literal reading and what the Supreme Court's saying. Um, and we have this uh, Earl Carnarvon quote, you know, uh, it reads uh, here, as we can say, you know, describing intercolonial trade uh, 
uh, you know, there's hostile custom houses guarding frontiers, adverse tariffs choke up the channels of intercolonial trade. There were customs agents at the border at Coteau de Lac between what was upper and lower Canada at the time, you know, watching those ships cross. Um, kind of crazy to think about in, in Canada these days, but that was a huge source of government revenue at the time, tariffs and custody. Right now, we have a very sophisticated income taxation system. It's very easy for governments to capture revenue from individuals and corporations. Back then, the easiest way to capture revenue was at admission at a port or border uh, point. Anyways, what else? I mean, Earl Carnarvon was one guy. What else were they saying? Um, we got George Brown here. Uh, you know, he's got this great quote, uh, what had just happened for these uh, drafters of confederation I'm talking 1867 they had just lived through back to back uh we started this conversation back to back um assaults on canada's economy from foreign states in the 1840s the british had this very privileged system of tar of, of uh, tariffs that was very favorable to canada called the corn laws and those were repealed in the 1840s and suddenly canadian producers had to compete with you know baltic timber and american wheat and so uh, that's what had been early, early days for these folks. And then just before Confederation, 1860s, uh, the U.S. abrogated from the Canada-U.S. Free Trade Agreement at the time. And so twice in 25 years, the drafters of Confederation had suffered at the hands of legislatures who decided they didn't want liberalized or they didn't want they wanted to change the terms of engagement when it came to trade. And so you had these drafters saying, well, what can we do? Let's turn inside. And yes, Confederation had a lot more to do with other things, you know, railroads and all that. But part of it was this notion that we were building a domestic economy where we could rely on one another and send our goods and services domestically. Um, and yet 150 years later, after these guys were talking what they were talking about, Kumo still gets detained with his 12 years. Um, again, federalism dimension, there are folks in this room who can speak far better about federalism than I can. But what I can talk about is how federalism connects with interprovincial free trade. We need to layer this on because it add a little bit of depth here. Um, for the Constitution Act, 1867, divvies up two, let's, we're focusing on two heads of power here. One is the trade and commerce power, which includes interprovincial trade. And one is property and civil rights, which goes to the provinces. And included there is this, you know, sale of a condo, things that you might suspect. And then there's also this regulation of trades and industries. Over time, jurisprudence has come out to say, okay, property and civil rights, a very vague term, but we'll give you regulation of trades and industries. How does this intersect with interprovincial trade? Well, there's a big, big overlap. Uh, and it comes, we can use the story of potash to really describe it. Um, Canada in 2018 produced one third of the world's potash. It's called Canada's magic pink powder is really important for the growth of crops. Um, in 1969, Saskatchewan's government fixed the quantity and price of potash. And sort of if you look back at what was being said at the time, it was to assure a healthy and sound industry. The extraction of potash is quite destructive. You know, you might have concerns about, you know, environmental human welfare. And so, you know, on its face, when you say it's to assure healthy and sound industry, you might, you know, might say, okay. But the fuller context was that in the early, late 60s, early 70s, Canada was about to get hit with some tariffs on its potash as the U.S. was trying to protect its New Mexican potash miners. So the, the Saskatchewan efforts to fix the quantity and price was in part to appease the Americans. And Supreme Court saw through this. And they said, you know, you're calling it a regulation of your trade and industry. What you're really doing is controlling the conditions of export of this good outside the province, whether it be elsewhere in Canada or abroad. And that's our territory. We are the ones who are in charge of interprovincial and international trade. Um, so now we've kind of got the constitutional backstory to the interprovincial trade uh, story. Now let's kind of get into the political dimension of this. And that's one of federalism um, and how Canada's current chapter in interprovincial trade has drifted from 121, drifted to recourse to the Constitution, and has come to these non political or non constitutional political agreements. Um, yeah, folks here might have taken, I don't, I, I, I'm again, I'll let others speak to federalism, but in broad strokes and crude form, there were various phases of federalism. And my thesis is that the agreement on internal trade, which came through in 1995, could not have happened until we got to the era of collaborative federalism. Um, because we, re we really required specific conditions in the state of Canada's political scene. Um, and in tandem, we needed, uh, we were there. So let's look at the domestic conditions that made it ripe to, re to seek recourse from an internal trade agreement, as opposed to constantly going back to the free trade agreements. Back to back, we'd had a really bruising 
process to repatriate the Constitution. We had had a failure of the Accords um, and the Quebec secession, uh, the list goes on here. And then we saw this increasing veering into the use of political agreements to resolve things. Um, there had been a provision in the Charlottetown Accord that was going to bolster what was 121 and really kind of bring some greater clarity to um, the Section 120 provision and make it stronger. But when the Charlottetown failed, so did that. I mean, Canada has known really since the first decision on Section 121, back with it's this gold seal case, prohibition in Alberta being used as a test case to fight this 121. It, well, that was more about fighting prohibition, but it was, you know, involving free trade itself. Um, but at the same time as we had these timely domestic conditions, we had this golden era of free trade. Canadian negotiators, when it comes to international trade, are renowned the well over. Canada is a middle power, had come to rely on international trade agreements to really protect its interests, had really strong negotiators both at the federal level and the provincial level, because so much of what was being negotiated at these fora had to deal with provincial jurisdiction. So you needed Nova Scotia's representatives, you needed Ontario's representatives involved, and you had this capacity building going on domestically. So the stars were really aligning for folks to say, wait a second, this model that's working abroad, um, we don't really see pathway forward when it comes to constitutional reform. You know, let's, we, there's, a, there's a merging of the two in the form of the Canadian Free Trade Agreement. Um, let's also talk a little bit about the discourse on what is free trade uh, and how has it been interpreted? I think the concept has evolved over time too. I alluded to this first decision, Gold Seal versus Alberta. That was about this, these folks who were trying to fight, fight, but their chief objective was to fight some prohibition rules instituted by provinces in the prairies. But what they used as their argument was the 121 argument saying, you're, you're trampling upon my rights to free trade. Um, and in that first decision, we had these uh, Supreme Court justices who come out and say, essentially, uh, this 121, all it means is it's simply about goods crossing between borders were to be free of customs duties or other like charges. Um, they reasoned that because the provincial temperance legislation didn't impose a charge, it was like a flat out you know, barrier, but because there was no charge, it wasn't in conflict with 121. So not, section or 1921, first time we're really hearing from the highest court, what does this free trade mean? Um, we move on to what I think is the second most significant case in, in recent history is uh, Murphy v. CPR. That one was, again, people are using Section 121 to fight Canadian institutions they don't like. First, it was prohibition. In 1958, it was supply, uh, supply management. Um, but anyways, they brought in 121 to try to help because uh, this gentleman, Murphy, he was feeding his turkeys out in BC, and he hated the elevated grain prices he was having to uh, pay to feed his turkeys. So he said, this is crazy. I don't like this supply management system we've got going. Um, you know, little did he know that turkeys would suddenly get their own supply management agreement uh, later on. But at that point in time, he was a loser in the situation. Um, and so uh, just as Ivan Rand, who was this, you know, he was... Uh, a globalist thinker. Um, he was, you know, his, his, his thinking and his participation in international fora really helped him. And he was arguably at the cutting edge of international law in Canada. And at that point in time, in a concurring opinion, so it wasn't the force of law, we suddenly had for the first time this idea that free trade was more than just about a dude at the border checking the value of what's in your trunk. It's a bit more abstract. It's about looking at what causes an impediment for, to a, related to a provincial boundary. That was now 70 years ago. Um, this, and then we finally come to the most recent case. And we finally, just as Ivan Rand long since passed away, but his, his ghost has come in the form of the majority opinion in Kumo, where now the new rule is, is the law in essence and purpose a restriction? Uh, does the law in essence purpose restrict trade across provincial border? So we've really drifted from that 1920s conception of a tariff and a barrier and really moved into this idea that it doesn't have to be about that. It could be about a restriction, something a little bit more. Let's take a step a level up. Let's go up a level. That's a 70 year lag time. So I don't think that, you know, we're averaging a rate of section 121 cases once every 20 years. So in about maybe 15, we'll see the next one and see them push the jurisprudence a little farther. What is a trade barrier? And I think I want to draw everyone's attention to the quote on the far right there, because I think trade barriers can be um, really disguised forms of protection. It, I mean, in many cases, uh, and this is part of the discussion in the second half of this presentation, um, they can be really hard to spot. You can have trade barriers like the one, there was the great example in South Korea, 
which said that foreign beef needs to be sold either in a separate section of the supermarket or in an entirely different store altogether. The reason being they were claiming that Koreans were getting confused about what was domestic Korean beef and what was foreign beef and they didn't want consumer uh, confusion. So they instituted this rule. WTO comes in and says, no, no, I mean, that's fine. We're not gonna come in and second guess your objectives here. If you wanna protect your consumers from that terrible, terrible Alberta beef, uh, you can do so. But there are other ways you could have enforced this rule without being so trade restrictive. But anyways, that's a real clear form of discrimination. But then, you know, direct discrimination, the most obvious form being tariffs, custom 12 and a half percent for your for your imported textiles from uh, Bangladesh. And then, you know, 5 percent from um, Sweden. And, you know, you can kind of see how that that barrier takes shape. Indirect discrimination, a little bit harder and usually um, um, shrouded in the arguments of consumer protection, welfare, safety. And because who's going to argue against fumigating apples that go to someone's classroom, right? Like it's it's it, you can't claim that's a trade barrier if you have, if you think you have a sincerely uh, held belief about that. Trade barriers now they're in the very highly technocratic sphere of you know for example here interprovincial trucking, different provinces have different max weights for tow trucks, heavy duty tow trucks. Different provinces have different max weights for those trucks barreling down their roads during the spring thaw. Some, you know, with reason, right? It comes back to that New Brunswick discussion. In Ontario, you have the Canadian Shield, which is very, very stiff, strong rock. So you can have heavier trucks and their claim can be, we can sustain that weight. You have it traveling over the prairies where it's a little different soil composition. And, you know, the question becomes, well, that's fine, but our roads are gonna take a hit. And so we have to balance the interests of trade with our infrastructure and, and uh, again, safety, driver safety. Um, the Supreme Court decision, let's, if we kind of zoom in a little bit more on this one here, uh, we've got a two-part test. One, does it impose a cost by virtue of it crossing up into the province? And the second one, uh, it has to have as its primary purpose, the restriction of trade. And really, the constitutional free trade provision has no power over those rules that incidentally uh, burden the passage of goods. And I know everyone in this room is probably saying, well, how do you distinguish when it's a primary, the primary purpose of a law is to impede trade and incident. Do you need like a, like a smoking gun? Do you need like an internal government memo that says we're instituting this policy for the protection of domestic consumers? And in fact, there was one case out of Alberta, Saskatchewan, where there was a smoking gun. You literally had internal documentation that got released that said, this is to protect local brewers. This is why we're imposing this markup scheme uh, to protect local brewers. But normally you're not going to see that. So, you know, we often do give, uh, you know, in Canadian jurisprudence, there are other ways in which we give judges the ambit to go search for primary purpose. Um, and, you know, it also boils down to like, uh, when you see an announcement from the politicians and it appears in the Globe and Mail or, you know, even in the Hansards, do you take that at face value? Like, what kind of search, what kind of tests are we asking? And, you know, Kumo 2018, primary purpose is the new test. We're going to have 20 years of lower courts helping us, you know, wade through this concept of the test, how to search. Um, but for now, what we can do is look at uh, elsewhere. How do they do it in the U.S.? How do they do it at the WTO? And here, it's the, the, the test is a little bit more searching, a little bit more nuanced. And there were actually some interveners in the Kumo decision that were really pushing the Supreme Court of Canada to adopt one of these types of tests. And it's, you know... That's fine. You can have whatever valid government purpose you want, but was there a less trade restrictive way of accomplishing the same objective? Like, if your purpose is to guard against uh, youth purchases and at alcohol at uh, liquor stores in New Brunswick, you know, maybe we can institute a policing regime if that's your if that's the true mischief we're after. Um, but if it's really just to guard government revenue, well, there's really nothing other than you being able to sell it yourself. So. Um, when it comes, so, you know, when you go back to the, the Korea beef example, um, or even there was a great case in uh, Australia where uh, Australia was not allowing uh, uncooked BC salmon to come into its borders out of fear that the domestic stock will get contaminated and spread disease. But equivalent fish, not just BC salmon, were not facing the same restrictions at the same time. And there it was evidence that you've got like two different schemes going on. What you're really doing is protecting Australian fish, uh, the Australian fishers. Uh, you're not really applying your own rule evenly. Uh, you know, there's your smoking gun and well argued. So if we have in Canada 
so let's assume we even adopt those arguments, those, those tests. Oh, you know, was it a necessary rule? Was, you know, New Brunswick's primary purpose and the way that they've set up and the cap at 12 beers, was it necessary to achieve? Well, who should be the judge? Um, you know, thinking out loud here, how does a, uh, a bunch of unelected judges getting to play policymaker Monday morning quarterback what the results of a well-negotiated, thought-through um, policy specialists have promulgated and given to elected officials to then pass in their legislatures. Uh, judge has gone to law school, worked as a lawyer maybe for a few years, gets appointed to the bench, gets in, gets to come in and play policymaker. It's a pretty sweet gig. You can do both. Do, do we really think that um, judges without subject matter expertise, whether it be on trucking weights and sizes or whether it be on construction codes, can come in, you know, securities industry, whatever it is, come in and get elevated to the realm of policymaker. There's in, in the domain of law, you got the separation of powers through, you got the legislatures passing the laws and you got judiciary for interpreting the laws, not creating the laws. And so we might actually say, even if the US and the WTO tools are more searching, um, we may not be comfortable with judges having that degree of authority. And uh, again, playing uh, Monday morning quarterback. Um, yeah, I mean, this is sort of a, a recap, uh, whatever, whatever it is, like if, if they argue, if the New Brunswick were to argue that we think that we can guard against overconsumption and spot um, issues within our communities better if we have local government folks running Aqua NB, um, you know, who is a judge to come in and say, well, this is how you should actually rearrange the sale of liquor in your province. Um, and so now we get to really I what I think is the, the, the path forward um, for a lot of, you know, there's no silver bullet when it comes to interprovincial trade. And we saw those numbers at the beginning, um, real hikes to GDP and, and um, to growth. Uh, but where, where do we find it? How do we unlock that? What's the solution? And um, I think that the Canadian Free Trade Agreement, formerly the AIT, is a huge, is a huge move in, this, in the right direction. It's a 30-year project. So Charlottetown Accord fails. They tried to bolster the economic union provision. They said, okay, what's, what can we do here? And so they came together with a political agreement and uh, modeled after the WTO. Uh, the WTO is on the Lake Geneva in uh, Switzerland and ours is in Winnipeg, which is very, very pretty, but it's, um, you know, but it harkens back to the foundations, which is these multilateral institutions. Um, in the time since, uh, so part of the part of the composition of the Canadian Free Trade Agreement. Sorry, back up. It's it's a listing of commitments, and it's got three core components. You got the national treatment principle: treat imports as you treat your own goods. Um, you know, you if you're going to give these kind of preferences to local apple producers, you got you can't accord anything worse to uh, foreign. Then you've got the most favored nation provision, where you got to treat two provinces the same. If you're you know Manitoba, you got to treat BC and Ontario products or services or goods the same. And then, but it also creates this carve out legitimate uh, government exceptions. You've also got governments who came into the CFTA and have explicit exceptions around particular industries, particular segments of their economy that they say are not up for grabs under the CFTA. CFTA also has a dispute resolution mechanism. How do you enforce folks to abide by the rules? You create an internal judicial apparatus, which is the dispute resolution mechanism. And so, uh, over again, uh, there's been 13 disputes since 95 all under the AIT. There's been no dispute under the CFTA, no dispute launched since you know, it was renegotiated back in 2017. Um, and if we look at this listing, uh, I think uh, we might <laughs> observe that there's an awful lot uh, related to dairy and dairy related products that have been under dispute. Um, but you also have some very interesting ones. And I think that over, over the lifetime of any institutional apparatus, you see the development of, of, of uh, its mechanism, how it works, the way it's set up now, I think, could stand for some reform. I think it's very expensive for a small, medium-sized business to launch a lawsuit, several hundred thousand dollars. And the crazy thing is that they're probably not the only economic actor encountering that barrier. So anyone can piggyback off of their hard work. So it creates a disincentive to be that first mover. It's a bit of a collective good. Um, and you've also got a system where, um, I mean, like the WTO, there's no forward-facing penalties or, or, sorry, retroactive penalties. And even if you are a private, this is getting into the weeds a bit, um, but right, the, the essence of it, there's no hope to recoup cost, um, especially between the initial and the secondary. So the, after the secondary is a private litigant, it goes into this communal fund, uh, not accessible by the litigants. Um, 
And so, you know, there's room, I think it's, it's an incredible step forward, unlike at the WTO, where only countries can launch cases against one another. In Canada, you can have individual private litigants take a case. So Artisan Ales was a, um, a case about um, a beer agent in Alberta taking a claim against Alberta for some discriminatory beer uh, markup schemes. And, you know, they saw it all the way through to the end of that and actually advanced the jurisprudence of the CFTA's dispute system which is really helpful, but you don't see a lot of those cases coming by just because uh, the structural limitations. But with that said, huge advance. Um, the next uh, big uh, avenue forward came in the 2017 renegotiations. And to get into the weeds a bit here, you've got this new institution, which allows for uh, subject matter experts, technical policymakers to come together. And uh, it's a formal venue and to arrive at agreements, whether they be reconciliation or mutual recognition in theory, um, to come together at what is known as the regulatory uh, reconciliation cooperation table. This is a huge, I just wanna put this in perspective for everyone. No other country has this apparatus where you have this internal free trade agreement, an internal dispute mechanism to fight essentially trade war, uh, to trade um, legal claims. And then uh, a, a mechanism dedicated to resolving claims that really shouldn't be litig litigated about because they're so thorny. Like you can't litigate your way out of uh, irreconciled building codes. You need subject matter experts who are uh, encouraged at the political level um, to come together and arrive at uniformity. Um, when you have uh, differences in um, how those specific trades are, are regulated, you come back to the or, uh, first principles of this. What's going to happen? Your costs of produce, production and supply augment because of these uh, disharmonious regulations. And, you know, one can argue that they're in place for a reason. Um, that being said, the, the, the downstream consequence being the augmented cost. Um, Construction codes was a great example. And this one was one where uh, we had for multi, it was a multi-year process to bring um, regulators who, who it's uh, under the guise of PETAPAC and they came and they negotiated over the course of several years to, to uh, resolve these trade errors into the form of construction codes, allowing for labor to move uh, more easily, compliance costs to decrease and operators to move across jurisdiction more seamlessly. Savings were massive in the order it was projected somewhere up to 2 billion in the first five years. And when we talk about, again, the costs of uh, providing housing, um, this is one of those levers of policy that governments have at their disposal um, to help um, the common good and create markets. There is, um, you know, again, coming back to something more concrete, it can be used to create harmony on the approach we were discussing earlier about electric vehicle infrastructure, forward looking policy issues that could create real trade irritants if you don't have the same infrastructure from across borders. Or, you know, ones that have been around for eons. Canada didn't have its, you know, the concept of interprovincial trucking didn't exist until the early 60s. And in a lot of cases, even to date, but certainly after the 60s, shortly afterwards, you saw a lot of trucking routes having to go dip down through the US or uh, transfer their payloads um, onto, onto shipping in the Great Lakes, uh, onto boats. Um, and you have, there's no overweight, oversized corridor through Canada. In many cases, those trucks have to route through the states to get back up to their final destination. On overweight permits issues, even if you get that permit and you're allowed to cross, and going from Nova Scotia to Alberta can involve something on the order of five or six different permits, to go from Texas to Alberta takes one. Um, and that's one of those ones where the argument is, yes, we need to control what's traveling across our roads, but there's definitely, especially in the domain of, uh, uh, to get into another weedy issue, uh, trailers. Um, how long do your licenses to, for trailers, those permits exist? For some provinces, you have a lifetime permit. For some provinces, it's one year. That is a pure source of revenue for governments. And so for them to give that one up, that's sacrificing however much they, they have to do cost benefit analysis and say, well, where are we gonna find that million dollars we're getting on the permit renewals for trailers? Um, so, you know, thinking about what is, what is ahead? Um, we've talked the whole full gamut on, on interprovincial trade at this point. Um, we're going to have another section 121 case advance the jurisprudence. Um, we're going to have uh, this, but you know, if we think about Canada sort of lagging even internationally, 
the term free trade no longer super attractive anymore. We went from the North American Free Trade Agreement to the USMCA. There's something about free trade that we may not we may not like as a society. There are true, and we've seen it over the past you know 30 years post NAFTA. There are true losers in the world of, of free trade. So maybe it's no longer a policy imperative, but maybe we reframe it in the perspective of creating markets and creating uh, strength. Um, we build stronger Canadian companies. Uh, we build stronger exporters. When you think about three quarters of what we produce comes is exported, right? If you think about all the inputs, let's say you know there's some rough early estimates that interprovincial trucking imposes 11% bump on cost of goods just because of non-distance policy factors. And if every input into let's call it uh, an engine, something complex that requires 30, 40 different pieces. If everything is seeing that hike and all the way down the value chain, that interprovincial trucking bumping 11% at every step of the way, you know, Canada is really doing itself a massive disservice when it's trying to fight um, economically against some pretty strong competitors internationally. Uh, one of the challenges when it comes to, you know, the RCT, the, the new, you know, space, and there are some truly passionate, dedicated, and very impressive folks who work on the interprovincial trade files in the further governments across Canada and at the federal government. Um, really, really impressive. And, and, you know, the idea is we can, you know, find, find recourse into technical policy experts. Um, you know, there, there are, it's game theory, it's still negotiation, you're gonna have some provinces, very strong, 14 million people, and you've got some provinces, Nova Scotia, 1.5 million, and you've got some asymmetric balances there. And it comes down to, you know, neg negotiation theory, what does one jurisdiction have that the others don't, why would I give up access to this domain of my economy, I can't really get much from that. Um, and, but I, and not only that, but even within government, you have this concept of bureaucratic diffusion on the same policy. So for example, when the federal government is engaged with foreign uh, trade, you know, when it comes to ag, ag, uh, agriculture negotiations, you've got one department that, you know, Ministry of Agriculture responsible for expanding Canadian access to foreign grain seeds. And at the same time, you've got Agricultural Canada, who's trying to protect Canada's far, uh, mark farmers and supply management. So within uh, ministries, you might have some incompatibility, but even across line ministries, you may have uh, government actors who may not be on board with the thesis of liberalization, which hinders that progress. Um, yeah. But we've got this framework, we've got, it's 30 years old, really post pandemic, this RCT, which I think is super exciting. And we can talk about that more if you really want to later. Um, six years old, but half of it during pandemic circumstances. Post pandemic, we've seen a, a huge retrenchment of provincial governments to preferring local, um, you know, supporting their local uh, corporations. And, you know, again, this is one of those things where, you know, we have a federalist system and we have provinces who are endowed with the powers to do what they'd like. You know, they may not be CFD, CFTA compliant, but those are the policy preferences of a democratic society. But I think the real risk comes when you suddenly have market, and we see it right now, it is very timely. We have folks going after the grocery sector for hiked, uh, for, for elevated grocery prices. But really when it comes to creating a competitive Canada and an affordable Canada, you can't just go after the grocers. It's, it's, it's a whole of government approach. And interprovincial inter trade is no longer really about trade barriers, those customs duties. It's about mitigating regulatory irritants and about recognizing that these internal fiefdoms that exist within Canada can have almost as an adverse effect on a, the strength of an economy as, as you know, what, what, as some of those bigger institutions I don't need to name right now. Um, but within Canada, that the Competition Bureau is, is, is uh, examining uh, closely. Um, that being said, um, you know, if we talk about this realistically, again, you've got asymmetric power, provinces of 14 million and provinces of 150,000. You've got, or I guess 500,000 now maybe, but, um, uh, and you've got the rise of, of the, you know, the push towards the regulatory uh, reconciliation. Um, you need a federal government who I think is going to got to be involved and has got to be able to step in and handle the distributive consequences when there's going to be uh, winners and looters, losers in the game of uh, resolving trade irritants. And that's what's going to get people to the table. Um, so with that, uh, that concludes my uh, formal presentation. But uh, thank you very much. Thank you.
very much, Brian, for a uh, very comprehensive Review on public policy perspective on it. Um, it's a classic area in, it, in all its complexity. This, this area of public policy is to create a convention on which some of us and uh, can't be under Sam one without the other. When you when you when you ban the bush and you ban the fly. Of course, you know, we're all in our silos because the scientists, the economists, the sociologists, whatever. I mean, I'm not saying that that's the end, but when you get into uh, the practice of public policy, when you're in governance, it, it, it's very comprehensive. It's much, much more of a blend of, of ideas. So it's very powerful when you make you know tell free trade the kind of the metaphor. And it forced us to think about, about, um, about uh, how broad we want to take free trade. Free trade, and, and I have a little bugbear about people say that Canada is not as free as, say, Canada and the U.S. is. We have a lot of free trade in Canada, in Canada and the United States, in, on goods, but much less so on services. And significantly less so on labor, because you can't uh, you can't just go down to the United States and knock on the door and get a job. Uh, whereas you can still do that from Nova Scotia to uh, uh, Alberta, right? And, and vice versa. That actually these days is a lot more possible in Nova Scotia. But Canada is a Canada's economic system composed of all those too, including the monetary union, which is a very basic for our labor There are a few exceptions, like doctors, like you think all the might be in the medical services. And so I wouldn't be I'd be interested to hear your comments on you know some of these non-goods related Mm -hmm. uh, you know, booze is an interesting one mm -hmm. because it's, you know, you're going to use words uh, alcohol here. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's a fascinating one. Mm -hmm. And if you think of what prohibition is all about, it's to protect the public morals. That's what No one would say that. No one would say that. But, but that's what it was, right? And, and, and the WTA has a rule for it. If, if you can demonstrate that a law was about protecting the public morality or environmental integrity or something like that, well, then that will uphold, even if it has deleterious trade effects. So that's where, you, that's where, as you say, mm -hmm. that you get into the weeds of trying to sort out when is a law having to do with those unintended consequences. Or is in fact is it just a mask for protection? Mm -hmm. So yeah, lots of interesting issues. Um, uh, including the one about federalism and uh, you know and, and, uh, because one of the great problems that we face in Canada negotiation with the original agreement on internal trade was that for most of in that agreement, all the problems that we have been So it's not a legislature where no, nobody asked for unanimous consent in any legislature on earth. Why would they ask the federal the, the provinces to get unanimous consent? But no, they will not agree to anything other than unanimous consent. It makes the bar extremely hard to have you know a lot of consent. So so that might be an interesting way forward. 
the regulation. But uh, anyway, I'm hoping that we could suggest some potential issues that people can can uh, discuss. Uh, let's start it off. I, I see you moving your hand up. Thank you for fascinating presentation. I'm probably the least qualified to talk. But uh, actually, I'm, uh, I'm shocked. Uh, now I'm, I, I try to think whether uh, in any of my travels from Montreal back and forth, I infringe rules. I have <laughs> no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I, I, uh, I take the Politically, uh, you don't, you might not have the political will of the premiers to agree. Mm -hmm. But coming from Romania, coming from Romania, if this were to happen in Romania, where a clear uh, article of the constitution is interpreted the way whoever likes to interpret it, everybody will point the finger to the country and will say, but of course, what the heck do you expect from those, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Romanians yeah. who no, don't know anything yeah. about rule of law. Now, how is it possible in a rule of law country like Canada to have a constitution, that's the constitution, that's not just a law somewhere in the darkest corner of the whatever yeah. I know how can you have this situation when the supreme court which which is not a constitutional court yeah again eastern europe has mm -hmm. it because they were infringing on the constitution yeah. on a regular basis yeah, yeah. So, but but it, it is responsible for upholding constitutional yeah. rights. No. So I'm appalled. <laughs> <laughs> so so it's a, a really good point. I think on two things, two two things. One is I think you run into a real risk of democratic uh, illegitimacy when you you know the consumer the the constituent sees the constitution and sees its interpretation totally different by the you know unelected judges. I think there's there's a legitimacy concern, right? I mean, we, we have to kind of take into account the way that, you know, jurisprudence kind of lags. It takes time for ideas. You know, it wasn't even until the 70s that we really thought of, you know, non-tariff trade barriers as a trade barrier. So the argument is like up until the 70s, we couldn't really have thought that was going to impact what we meant as free. Um, yeah, but I mean, you bring, a, you bring an, um, an important point too, and is reframing this conversation as you know what, what is Canada Are we, we accept like if we think okay I think it should be okay for like we're you know whatever the arguments are in favor of supply chain management are in favor of liquor control by the provincial uh, you know ministries of finance so uh, you know Nova Scotia's uh, you know the LCBO in Ontario maybe those are like just happy compromises and that's what's keep what keeps us together as a federation and a, a sacrifice for what we're willing to see an 11 percent bump on trucking goods because you know we like the way that it's, it's, a, it's a necessary consequence for the way we built our ability to tether together, you know, the biggest landmass, second biggest landmass as a country as such diversity and geography and environment. And there are some legitimate issues about, you know, with the trucking, there's legitimate issues about the soil not being able to sustain the weight of the trucks that can go in Ontario. So maybe we're happy, but I think there, there comes the risk where there's this disenfranchise and it comes with competition policy in general, where we see protected interests uh, accruing a great degree of the wealth and um, it being, you know, again, these like little protected fiefdoms who have the ear, the vested interests who've got the ear of government and are able to control those markets. And, and, you know, I think there may be some folks in this room who are familiar with whatever industry it is where they're from, where the main producers do get together in a room and they talk about what prices they're setting their, their goods at, their services at. There's a little, you know, harder to point your finger at. It's not as big as the Rogers Shaw deal. Um, but, you know, wouldn't be surprised if some folks have heard of that. Yeah, I have a question. How often is section Hmm. Yeah, no, it's... 
it, it is sometimes, but I think that trail went off maybe about two decades ago. The way that it's coming back a little bit now is kind of what we spoke to about this approach. It's Australia's got the model, it's called mutual recognition. It's this idea that, hey, if you got licensed to be a nurse practitioner in Alberta, we're going to say that's that's good enough for us. Again, there's something special about the fact that we're all of the same citizenship. Like we just, my taxes flow there. I kind of trust the way that they license their, their dental hygienists over there. Um, and allowing that labor mobility to fester under the principles of this mutual recognition concept, I think is what I think is where the puck's heading. Um, and it may be surgical, surgical approaches to particular professions, but it really comes down to these intergovernmental agreements where they say, and then Australia, really cool model, you're almost presumptively allowed to practice your profession, your trade in another jurisdiction. So if I'm in one state A and I go to state B in Australia, you're presumptively allowed. You come in, you alert the local authorities that you're working there, and it's up to them to tell you, oh, no, 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 by the way, that you're, whatever you came from, not good. We got, we got, you got to do this test. You can practice under restricted license. You can't, you know, you can't do this, that, the other, because you were never trained for it in your home jurisdiction. But the presumption is that you can, which I think is really powerful. A really good question about mobility rights. Yeah, so I would like to preface it by saying, you know, any restrictions on the free market that are not <laughs> raised by you. <laughs> Coupled with the fact that we combat ball productivity with enough trees and enough labor, although you can move around, you've had it there. You need different sort of certificates and mm -hmm. different sorts of there are regulatory bodies that prevent these things mm -hmm. from going free. Is this something that we can actually make a Canadian priority? Great question. Pie in the sky. <laughs> and I think if you talk to a lot of folks, there's certainly frustration with the pace and with some pushback from protected interests. I think you've named some. I think there's some licensing authorities who who really do control the supply of new labor into their jurisdiction. Um, and where what's the what's the pass through? I think it becomes uh, and what Professor Brown says is absolutely right. You know, a premier thinks through the lens of how do they get reelected. You know. Um, how do I make this a relevant topic for my people? And that comes in the form of reframing the debate Debate to, I'm gonna give my people access to nurse practitioners. I'm gonna give, I'm gonna increase the supply of doctors. And that's where incentives align with opening up to those who are outside of province, but also winning over your domestic, like reframing it as like, or you know, cost, again, cost of labor supply for housing. Can't, can't find, uh, yeah, so really good question. And it, it comes down to the, the book, Booze, Cigarettes, and Cost. Interprovincial trade, really thorny. If you really get into it now, again, construction codes, building codes, you know, downfield duvet regulations, really kind of let's set. The more sexy is the booze and the cigarettes. And that's why people kind of like it. But, you know, you have to, you have to create the, um, the story. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, what I would say, I think, yeah, European Union, absolutely a great model. Australia, fantastic model. Um, but I think there are lessons to be learned. And it really comes down to also like the surgical implementation. I don't like to use the word, the T word, the Trump word. Um, but I think what Trump came to power on in part was a disconnect between how the economy worked and how the people perceived it. And I think what you're getting at is there's a disconnect between, let's call it, you know, in your words, the political class and what's happening on the ground. And I think the more those two worlds diverge, the greater the threat. And I think the Competition Bureau in Ottawa under Commissioner Boswell is, is attuned to that. And I think that there's real move to reform the Competition Act. But I also think that the 
the internal trade plays a massive role in that because I think that you can't you can't you know uh, litigate some of your issues away. I think it comes down to reconciliation on the rules and opening up domestic markets. But absolutely, European great model uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah it does exist um you know let's the dom the dormant commerce clause that searching test saying um you know if you if you're going to interfere on uh inter interstate trade it, well i mean first first principles i think the federal government has a little bit more of a stronger hand, hold on the commerce clause in the u.s but this dormant commerce clause being you know, uh, you have to show us that you couldn't make this a less restrictive barrier. So when North Carolina instituted a rule saying, you know, Washington state has great apples and everyone, you know, people in the US tend to know what the Washington grades on those apples mean. It's a source of information. And North Carolina said, okay, no, we don't, you can't put those markings on it. We don't want people to even see that they were a Washington state apple. You have to use, you know, USDA grade. You have to use something else. You can't communicate in that language because it's deceptive to consumers or something along those lines. And the Supreme Court came in and said, look, I mean, why not you, why, why can't you prevent the, what it, all you had to do was say you have to have the Washington grade and the USDA grade or and whatever grade you you like. You can't push off that Washington grade that people kind of come to understand and know, you know, Washington's got some great apples. I want some of them. Um, so they've got this stronger judicial test, a little bit more searching, not saying that inter interstate trade issues don't rear their heads, but their Section 121 apparatus is, has got a little bit more teeth to it. Yeah, that's a good, good question. That's a very good question. Um, I would actually have to do a bit more digging to see the nexus between, like, figure out there. I'm sure there is one. And I know that, you know, 121, the creation of a single marketplace was not the primary objective uh, of, you know, the uh, drafters of Confederation. And I'm also very cognizant of the fact that a lot of the, you know, a lot of the constitutional apparatus that we have was from a unitary state and superimposed onto, the, again, the second largest landmass where we have provincial and this division of powers between Section 91 and 92. And so from a historical perspective, you're like, you guys never really had to deal with this issue. Like markets were small. I mean, interprovincial trucking, again, not really a thing until like the 60s. Like people tried to do it, but you didn't really need it. You didn't have that same concept. Um, rail was there. And so in many ways, like this new era of interprovincial trade, we're seeing, you know, the uh, impacts of, of a more globalized market, you know, a lot of, a lot of fierce, uh, and, we're, and we're seeing um, the limitations of this framing of the, the 1867 mo or model, the lagging understanding of what free trade means in our jurisprudence. Um, but yeah, to your immediate question, I'd have to do some digging for sure. Good question. Mm -hmm. Given our cash flow economy, isn't that it, that benefits throughout the top economy? Mm -hmm. Or are we only considering it when it can't touch the top line that we have? So you take the um the realm of professional services. If you were to decrease the um uh, barriers by let's call it 1%. And I know this is really abstract. What is 1% of the barrier of, of interprovincial inter uh, exchange of professional services? Uh, that's equivalent to $700 million uh, in the Canadian GDP. So whatever form you want it to take, it, it bolsters it 
um, and it, 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 it augments the cost. Um, so, uh, and it really depends on when you're thinking about it. So professional services, top end of the value, you know, you might say it's the top end of the value chain, trucking, top end of the value chain, financial services, top end, because it feeds into every segment and then it, you know, compounds all the way down to the final product of that widget, that engine that's made, that car that's made. And so the higher up that, that restriction is and the irritant is, the worse of an effect it has, um, if, that, if that's illustrative. But, yeah. Yeah. That being said, again, I want to come back to the to underscore that, you know, Alcool New Brunswick, $140 million in revenue that they get to apply to schools, to roads, to churches, whatever it is that they choose to do. Um, like, yes, we can be kind of cynical about it being a revenue base, but it does facilitate public policy decisions in New Brunswick. So we can say, you know, look at that as like a restriction that's really causing it, it makes it so much harder for Mr. Kumo to, to buy cheaper beer. But on the other hand, Mr. Kumo got to drive on a paved road. Maybe that's the argument. We allow for these differences. Every province decides how they want to capture uh, its fiscal revenue base differently. And that's what brings us under, um, uh, uh, you know, one unitary state or not a unitary state, but a confederation. Um, there's no right answer. I don't think the answer is that we should have zero trade barriers, that these numbers should all be zero, should be no cost, because I don't think that's a Canada any one of us would recognize or want. It's that finding that balance and figuring out where are we comfortable and where does the trade off mean that housing is more affordable um, and, uh, you know, it comes closer to our expectations of what it be, means to be in a Canadian society. Yeah. Here, come here to this. Well, the, yeah, the, the one comment I would have from the 90s experiences, which I studied, was that um, there was a lot of the provinces could agree to bring down their barriers as much as they did then, um, you know, with a very limited approach, admittedly. But partly because it was tacked on to the general idea and the general scheme of free trade, both internationally with the World Trade Organization and also with the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement. Because they, and this gets back to the old national policy. Certainly people in the Atlantic provinces felt that the national policy was highly discriminatory. All the manufacturing got concentrated in Southern Ontario. And you know, people out West and people in the Atlantic you know, were playing some more secondary, uh, less lucrative roles. And so they liked free trade. And so if, if, if it was perceived as a barrier by the Americans, for example, for wine, uh, then they, they wanted to sell their wine into Canada. Uh, well, then that, that did the heavy lifting for selling BC wine into Alberta or to Ontario. Um, so uh, in a context, so the question is what, what, what's dry, what, that's one th comment I would make is that uh, you know, if we if we came again to a period of international free trade impetus and growth, which we're not really in now, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that could again encourage another wave of progress on reducing uh, trade barriers in Canada. But how would you summarize, like I've been noticing, you know, your work is important in this, but a bunch of other organizations so it seems to be in the last three or four years a kind of revival of interest in these issues what's driving it where is the new political capital for for this issue uh, i think that's a really good question i think it's um you're right there's been i think a couple of reasons why there is an increased drive towards this. And this has a, been a perennial project since, you know, uh, again, the Confederation and, and beyond. Um, I think you've got increased um, uh, statistics. Can, I think one part of the answer is that I think it's increasingly easier for folks to quantify and, and, and compute. And I think that gives the narrative and it gives the, the platform to discuss in a provincial trade. Because again, we, as soon as we talk about numbers, everyone's like, whoa, like you're like 11%, what the heck? And I think that the power of numbers, wherever you might fall on their accuracy, really lends weight to that conversation. I think folks are really seeing um, escalating cost. And I think we're looking about 
uh, what's within our control. Like during the pandemic, you know, borders shut, we couldn't get masks, but you know, we had Ontario and Alberta and Quebec, you know, pushing PPE around to one another. Um, and I think it's that if we look to history, the repeal of the corn laws, US abrogation, I think this is another manifestation of re increasing global isolation, you know, US retreat, US won't even institute, uh, doesn't really want the, the WTO to persist in its current form. And it's again, that, that inclination to sort of source back to what you can control. And, and I think that's part of it. Um, yeah. The, the numbers thing is really, really, just on that final point, for a while between the US and Canada, the US, the standard truck was 53 feet and uh, the Canadian standard truck was 48 feet. And when you got to the border, you had to shift your, your payload from one truck to there because you couldn't transport with it. And the numbers coming out of that barrier, five foot barrier on that truck on the order of $100 million a year to the transportation industry. And when you put those numbers in front of people and say, you know, like that has to go, someone's got to sustain, like someone's incurring that cost and that's going down to the consumer. And I think as soon as you can create that, that body of, of work that really points to the problem, because otherwise we're in an abstracted territory where we've got protected interests, don't really understand what's going on. And um, for all I know, you know, things are working out, but you know, I, then I realize um, that the, the simple disconnect on trucking sizes is what's driving some of this. So. Yeah, I mean, the, the grand theory of negotiations, and I'm, I'm sure Professor Brown can speak to this a bit more better than I can, but, you know, back in, what was it, 2018 or 19, you had an instance where Alberta was trying to get more bitumen out to the coast, and, you know, BC wasn't going to facilitate this. <laughs> so in response, Alberta said, oh, that's fine. Well, we won't sell your wine in our, in our province. Um, and it's the levers that they eat, they both have. They've, you know, when in Canada down in D.C., you know, they, they've figured out whenever you see U.S. protection go up at software lumber, you then suddenly see a whole bunch of random tariffs in Canada go up. Like, why did peanuts skyrocket, you know, or why did blueberry? It's because you've got some very, very sophisticated trade uh, folks down in, in, in government Canada who know the levers. They know the, the, the folks they got to push, you know, the senators and the Congress people um, to, to get to where they need to get. It's, it's a grand game. And absolutely, I think, you know, it, and I'm Professor Brown, and maybe you could speak to this, the early negotiations of AIT and CFT, there are probably some issues that Nova Scotia, Ontario would be fine giving up. But if they gave them up, and another province wants that, you have lost your leverage on an issue that you care about. So it suddenly it creates a bit of like a, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's always true that you have to have some, you have to have some chips to give away. Although also since it's politics, um, you, you can occasionally get premiers who will um, say, look, if you give it, you, they'll say to the federal minister, we'll agree to this. We know it's really important. We know it's really big part of your agenda. Okay, so if you do that for us on this, if we do that for you on this file, you know, then they'll say another completely entirely different uh, uh, file of public policy. Let maybe say healthcare or equalization or something like that. And they'll say, "Can't you give us?" And 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 while you know, a lot of especially the federal government hate to have any messiness between the silos. They have to deal with it every once in a while. And so you know, so you have to understand the political needs of the premiers. And, but doesn't always have to be, that negotiation doesn't have to be. I'll just tell you a funny little story when there was this huge debate in the, around 86 about whether the provinces would be in the room or at the table with the US negotiators and the, you know, and the federal negotiators for the Canada US free trade agreement. And, and we used to, the Newfoundlanders, I was working in the Newfoundland government then, we used to joke with the Nova Scotians and say, 
Well, you, are you guys in favor of this? You're gonna be at the table or not? The Nova Scotians would just say with a wink, no. We just, we're just happy if we're under the table. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, what goes around comes around sort of thing, you know? So it can be quite informal and therefore, you know, harder to pursue your sophisticated game theory, yeah, if yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah. 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 Um, Let's let's take a one or two more questions if there are. So what's what's the province with the lowest uh, prices for alcohol and gas? <laughs> you tell me so that I know right now. <laughs> I think there's an app for that. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but Alberta under Premier, former Premier Kenny was definitely at the forefront of interprovincial trade liberalization. Talk about there was, you know, the, the, I think it was the Canadian media called them the Gang of Eight. It was a bunch of right of center premiers in the late 2010s. And, you know, uh, after Notley had left government and uh, being the type that, you know, might push the, the envelope. Because, you know, if you think about it, maybe it, fit, it was consistent with their views of, of, of the world. Um, but Premier Kenny was was really sort of forward looking, and I mean he was definitely a strong advocate for things like mutual recognition. They've got this really fascinating we were describing it before fascinating project in Lloyd Minster, which straddles Alberta and Saskatchewan. And in order to sell meat across the provincial border, it needs to be processed at a federal uh, federally licensed abattoir, which created some really weird issues for a city where it's like one side of the road is Saskatchewan, the other side is Alberta, and so they're doing this pilot project where you know, you're gonna la get a bit more lax on those rules and allow for more permissiveness outside of those, the, the constrained environment. I think that that's the sort of in it, policy innovation that uh, was coming out of Alberta and I think uh, could be replicated elsewhere. But yeah, Alberta, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to speak into the mic. I just wanted to say thank you so much for um, gracing us with your presence. I'm sorry the weather didn't hold up, um, but this has been an amazing talk. We are so proud of you for winning the Donner Prize. Um, the book is also up for the Balsilli Prize. This, this book is a finalist for the Balsilli Prize. Um, and so we're our fingers are crossed November 28th is when the winner is announced. So, you know, go Mulrooney Institute and <laughs> booze and cigarettes. Um, so I wanted to say thank you again. And I will spoil the surprise of what's in, in your gift bag. Um, because of the title, we're giving you two wine glasses uh, from the Mulrooney Institute. That's amazing. To thank go you. with your booze. Oh, thank you so, so much. Thank you, thank you much. so much. Also on November 28th, uh, Minister Michelle Thompson is going to be our next distinguished speaker. So keep an eye out for um, the announcement with more details. Thank you so much. We appreciate it when you come out. These are for you. So we're, we're so glad that you could come out on a rainy night, uh, not unlike the last three nights. Um, <laughs> but thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to hosting you again. Thank you. Thank you.